But I begin. I would like to thank you, Branjil, Vaibhav, and everybody who has been involved in all the arrangements. Everything has been super awesome. All the arrangements have been great, and I totally enjoyed all the shows before this talk. Yeah, thank you, sir. Before we dive into our discussion with uh, Sandeep, uh, let us set the stage for what promises to be an enlightening and engaging conversation. We'll explore his journey from being a teacher to becoming an entrepreneur and founding Geeks for Geeks and the challenges he faced along the journey and the valuable insights he gained along his experience. So starting from his journey as becoming a, uh, from a teacher to becoming an entrepreneur and founding Geeks for Geeks, could you share us uh, some pivotal moments that defined this transition for you? and the challenges you face along the way? So, uh, I mainly took four career decisions in my life. Uh, first was IIT G preparation. That was because everybody in my school was going for it. See, before 12, most of the decisions were taken by my parents and the elders. So, the first decision was IIT G preparation. And school topper was going for it, so I also went for it. And in our times, there was no limit. So, I appeared two times after 12 and then ended up in a college in Mathura and we had 0% placement there and <laughs> I appeared in IITG in the BTEC first year also and could not crack it. After BTEC, uh, I went for MTech in IIT Roonkey because I did not get a decent job after BTEC. And one thing very, very good happened in my life was I was very, very clear that I want to be a teacher. So after going to IIT Roonkey, there was second career decision that I took. I went for a software job. And this decision I took because everybody was going for those tech interviews. And those companies were paying high salary. So I forgot my teaching passion and appeared in every interview. And got placed in Deal Joint Company and worked there for 2.5 years. And this, after working for 2.5 years, there was one decision that I took on my own. And I did not go with the crowd. When I was working with the company, most of the people who were at the same stage in their careers, they were either going to look for US, UK or higher education. I decided to leave that software job and go for a teaching job. And believe me, I was like appearing in teaching interviews just after six months of this software joining. And I went for a lower salary. And this is the decision that worked best for me because I took a risky challenge or you can say I took some risk in my life going for a lower salary and that worked the best. And there was a movement in my life once I went for this uh, teaching job, there was so much social pressure around me because I was at a lower salary, living with a lower life standard, living in a thought flat. So there was a movement in my life when I thought that I should go back to the software job because my salaries have gone down and I started appearing into the software companies again and again and I got rejected by most of them. So that again thing happened very good for me and that with this software job and this teaching job I built Geeks for Geeks uh, part time but the pivotal moment and the best moment and the best decision in my life, the career decision that was there was going for a lower salary job and pursuing Geeks for Geeks and giving it more time. So do you still get a time to follow your teaching profession while working at the same time? Uh, I was I was teaching at Geeks for Geeks for a long, long time till last year. Last year what happened was uh, doctors told me not to record the videos. They said, you have overused your throat now and it, I mean, I started having some throat pain. So I stopped teaching now, but I still miss that. I mean, I before one year, I had a recording room in my cabin and whenever the meetings used to get over, I used to record a video and uh, I mean, the video person was always available to record the videos. But now I don't teach anymore. I, I don't teach anymore. The way I teach is now I do these college sessions. Great. As you navigated through this journey, like balancing the demands of successful platform like Geeks for Geeks and life and your life must have been surely challenging. So how do you manage the balance between them both? So uh, I I don't follow a particular routine that I need to uh, spend two hours daily with my family or I need to do this. I keep working, working, working and whenever I feel like now I need a break and there has been a lot of communication gap between my kids, my parents and my wife, then we go out and take a break. So I don't follow a particular routine but keep on taking breaks. That works best for me. So speaking of challenges, uh, what are some of the misconceptions that uh, people face uh, while pursuing a career in tech industry that you may have encountered along your way? So uh, first thing that most of the engineering students face as a challenge is when they enter into engineering, 
they think it like another academic course. They have studied in a standard academic uh, system till 12. That 11th year they need to do 12th and after that they need to do for graduation. And when they do engineering, they need to realize that after this degree, most, of, most likely you are not going for a higher education. You are going to go for a job. So it's not pure academics. You need to focus on a lot of other things. You need to make sure that you are upgraded, you are updated, you are aware. And you need to, and many students, that they, the mistake that they make is, they, when they come to third year, that's when they start thinking like, I need to appear for interviews now, I need to start preparation. It should begin from the first year itself. That is true. And uh, from the first year itself, you need to start appearing in the internship interviews. And uh, that's one mistake. Uh, many people start appearing for the internship interviews from the third year itself. I would say start from the first year. If I see two resumes, where the one person has very good academics and probably done has a lot of products, lot of projects, and the other person has a professional experience and an internship experience, I will prefer the other guy. So, looking at the current market scenario, sir, what should a person do if he is getting constantly rejected while applying? See, rejections are part of the journey. And again, one more difference that I would like to highlight. If you compare interview preparation with IITG preparation or UPSC preparation, in IITG preparation or UPSC preparation, you get only one chance, or the CAT preparation. You get only one chance in, a, in an year, right? And if you get rejected, you don't have any more chances. But if you talk about interview preparation, there are thousands of companies, and people don't realize it. I mean, you get rejected by one company and apply to another company, and even if the salary is not very, very high, first try getting a job, right? Get a job, maybe of any salary, then maybe negotiate with more companies that I already have this offer. If you are going to give me higher package, then I'll only I'll join you. And the HR reject candidates. You can also reject companies, right? If you have a job already. So uh, rejections are very, very common on social media. People don't share it. They only share that I got selected at Microsoft, Amazon, and so and so company. They don't tell that how many times they were rejected before it. Rejections are common. I have seen a lot of rejections in my life. I mean, I was rejected in IITG exam. Then I actually wanted to do PhD also to establish my career in teaching. I was rejected for PhD admissions by IITs, full-time PhD or part-time PhD admissions. And even now, people reject us. They say, we don't want to join your company because you are not offering that much salary. So rejections are always, VC rejected us. Rejections are always there at every stage of your life. Yeah, interesting. So uh, what advice would you give to the people who are just starting their career in information technology, considering all these misconceptions you mentioned? So uh, see, if, if you are uh, in the first year or second year, uh, don't make this mistake that you begin your interview journey from the third year or the second year. Begin from the first semester itself. And we all know that the way software companies hire is the first round is going to be online coding round. We all know it. It's a, it's a con it's something that every company does, right? HR says this best way to hire. So why to prepare for this round from the second year, third year, start from the first semester. Don't wait the faculty of padaying a data structures and algorithm, then I'll study, start from the first semester. And make sure that you become very good at DSA in the first semester or the second semester itself. And once you become good, then try learning a technology. Explore every technology. There are lots of things. And no technology is like bad that this is not used much in the industry. Every software company has an app, and every big company has an iOS app, an Android app. Every company has a security person, web security person. Every person has a, a DevOps person. Every person company has product manager, product designer, backend developer, frontend developer. So jobs are there in every company for every role, right? So explore every role and try to figure out what role looks more appealing to you. And earlier you do it, better for you. Because being an expert in any role requires a lot of time. It's not going to happen that you begin in the final year or third year and you will be employable in that particular tech. If you begin from the second year, that would be the best. Great. So with the world increasingly shifting towards online learning and remote work, how do you envision the growth? Uh, how do you envision the future of tech industry evolving? See, education, uh, we can clearly see that Class, there's no better option than the classroom teaching. Uh, when COVID happened, everybody was talking about uh, online education, what will happen to the classroom programs. But every edtech saw a decline in the online courses. School students started going to the schools. College students started going to the colleges. They started attending the classes. They started enjoying those classes more. And that's the best way to teach. I mean, 
But ultimately, I feel like it's going to be hybrid, a uh, classroom plus the tech enabled, and more tech you use, better for you, even in the classroom. So, uh, how how do you see the advent of conversational AI in this industry? What effects can it create in the future? So, uh, AI is definitely, definitely big. We, you guys, all know it. It's definitely going to change a lot of things. The kind of investment which is happening right now. The kind of focus every big tech giants has on AI. We talk to, we do work with all the tech, big tech giants, and we can see they all are focusing on AI. So it's definitely going to change everything. In fact, the hirings are going to change right now. People do interviews. It's going to happen in future. That AI interviews are going to happen. It's going to happen very soon once we have very good product builds around it. And uh, the way data science and AI jobs were there in India, there were very few uh, jobs in the past. We, although we were talking about it, people, colleges had degrees in data science AI, but there were very few jobs. But that percentage has grown drastically recently. You can say it, if it is right, if it is, was like say 5%, 2% one year back, it has become 20 to 30% now. And I don't know, maybe two years, five years, it's going to become 50% more than 50% in the software industry. But the question is, is the AI act right now currently accurate enough to do all these kind of things? But it's definitely, it's not, right now not accurate. I mean, the code it's generating is not perfectly fine and not good money time is not working at all, but it's going to improve. The kind of investment coming in, the kind of comp the money that companies are putting in, the kind of efforts people are putting in, it's definitely going to improve with time. So as we talk about uh, technical education, could you discuss the importance of soft skills alongside technical skills, which are necessary for the success in tech industry? Uh, before I talk about soft skills, I just want to add one more thing about this AI thing. I, I just want to add one more thing that we don't need to worry too much. I mean, anything that happens, even if it looks very fast happening, it takes a lot of time. I can give you an example of DevOps, uh, you know, cloud architecture. Cloud servers, AWS, Google, Azure, they came long, long back, 15 years. But they're still not able to replace on-prem servers even after 15 years. So AI change is not going to happen that suddenly there won't be any backend development jobs, any the small boards won't be generated by humans. It will take many, many years, and especially in India. Uh, even the on hiring, the way hiring used to happen in India was even engineers were higher on logical reasoning, aptitude, English, good discussion. And everybody knew that online coding challenge, hiring challenge is the best way to check logical skills, coding skills. Even Indian companies were hiring on logical reasoning after you three, four years back, they recently started hiring challenges. So it's going to take a lot many years. Uh, might happen fast, but it will take at least three, four years. So we don't need to worry about, about that too much. Everything will happen in front of you and you need to just adapt and be aware. Now coming to the soft skill question, uh, guys, soft skills are very, very important. Uh, once you reach a higher level at a company, your emotional intelligence, apart from the coding skills, are very, very important. And one thing that I've learned uh, with my entrepreneurship journey, the most important thing is to control your anger. I mean, that's the most important skill that you should have. If you're getting angry, just keep it controlled. Don't talk to that person probably a day or two, and you will be logical. And then after, if you keep your if you keep yourself controlled for a day, you'll be talking logically after a day or two with that person. So th that works with me all the time. Uh, how much of a role the soft skills play in hiring of a fresher like us? So when when you when we hire a fresher, the particular thing that I look for is uh, everybody likes to receive a positive feedback, even in the interview or when you are an employee in the company. If I keep telling you, you're doing a fantastic job, your answers were good. How do you take negative feedback? That's very, very important. Do you get angry or how do you take it? Do you take it constructively or how do you react upon it? That's very, very important skill that I check personally. And I mean, there might be more skills that people might be checking it. Uh, for me, uh, you know, if you're a tech person, whether you speak English, Hindi, it doesn't matter as long as you're communicating clearly. Communic clear communication is very much needed. I mean, I remember I appeared in an in interview of Microsoft when I was on campus interview when I was being interviewed on campus by company in ID Roorkee. And first round I qualified because that was that round was you know just online written test or written test. I, in our days they were not online rounds. The second round they asked me uh, as the candidate who selected the first round to sit in a room and solve a problem. And I was focusing too much on the problem. I wasn't interacting with the interviewer. 
right? And a lot of us were not interacting. They selected only those people who were interacting with the interviewer, who were speaking about their approach very loud, who were asking questions from the interviewer about the corner cases, about the approaches. This, I was rejected in the round. So co clear communication and regular communication, what is going through your head, it's very, very important even in the interview, even in the working environment. Managing both kind of skills is equally necessary. Sure, I mean, definitely. So, let us switch gears a bit. Uh, everyone makes mistakes. So what is your horror bug story uh, in your coding days? So I have been uh, stuck on many occasions. I, I got stuck in my uh, project interviews by the Viva people. I got stuck, I mean, I, in ID Road, I was like completely blind when I gave my project Viva in that uh, uh, the, the man who was taking, she was very strict and she was about to give me re re-evaluation, but I got saved. I just somehow clicked that what I was trying to say. And uh, even when I started teaching in the classes, I got stuck many times and I was writing code on the board. I mean, I, we started offline classroom and in the first classroom itself, I got stuck. So it happens with everybody. I got stuck many times in the whiteboard interviews in the companies, even uh, when I was working in a company. So coding is not easy. I mean, uh, use respect for the people who crack those top product based companies. They take uh, a lot of rounds and there are chances that you might get rejected in any round and uh, it's it's like really very hard skill to learn and uh, I mean everybody gets stuck. I got stuck many times. Between coding and entrepreneurship, which is more difficult? So uh, entrepreneurship is definitely more difficult. It's like a treadmill. I mean the company grows, the things grow, the speed keeps on growing and you keep you need to keep running faster and faster. I mean I found entrepreneurship more uh, difficult because when you're coding you're completely logical. You are interacting with a machine, right? Whatever you write, you are going to get a logical answer. With entrepreneurship, you are going to interact with a lot of humans, a lot of emotions involved, and a lot of emotional problems and a lot of people problems. So this definitely gets more problematic. I can tell you guys, when I was coding and when I was working as an individual, I was doing geeks for each as a part-time for a long, long time. And during those days, working 14 hours, 15 hours was never challenging. I never felt tired. But when I became like, now we have 500 people in the company and when I talk to a lot of people, a lot of problems, a lot of stress, I mean, I feel really tired when I interact with the people. So uh, coding is definitely easier. So interacting with the machine is much more easier much than Much more easier than humans. <laughs> okay. So on a lighter note, describe your coding setup. What snacks, beverages or music do you like to get in the zone? So I am not very shocking kind of guy. I don't, uh, you know, enjoy a lot of things. I don't enjoy parties. I never attended college fest also, but I miss those. I mean, when I saw, see you guys performing here, I feel like I should have attended. I enjoyed all the performances here, but I don't enjoy any particular music. I like 90s music. I mean, that was the time when I was young. So I enjoy the 90s music. I enjoy tea also that, and that works best for me. So now if you could add any unconventional feature to Geeks for Geeks, what could it be? Uh, I mean, I don't know what can I add right now, but I mean, there are a lot of things that happened by the accident on Geeks for Geeks. You know, uh, we have a lot of interview experiences on Geeks for Geeks. And when I was building it, there was no plan of having interview experiences on Geeks for Geeks. Uh, we ju I, I mean, I just used to write a lot of content. And uh, I just used to write this line that if you like Geeks for Geeks, you can also send your contribution to uh, contribute at the rate of geeks.org and I'll publish it. And a lot of students started sending their uh, questions. They started sending that, hey, this question was asked to me in uh, this company interview and I gave this answer and I was selected. So I used to publish their uh, answers. I used to define this code a lot. Sometimes it used to take two, three hours. Sometimes it used to take the whole day to understand that code. And one day what happened was a student from IRT BHU sent an email saying that, hey, I got a place in this company and this this was my interview experience. And I don't know if there were any website which was publishing interview experiences before us. And that was the most unconventional feature I found. And uh, I went through that interview and I was like, what kind of contribution it is? Should I publish it or not? And I was confused and I finally published it, you know, whatever he, this guy wrote. And when I published it, I wrote the same line that if you also write, then you write an email to contribute at the rate of geeks.org and I started receiving a lot of emails and that worked right, like really great. So that I found is the most unconventional feature that we had in the initial days. Was there a time like you thought 
I should add this feature in Geeks for Geeks and then you didn't. Uh, I mean, so initially I was publishing a lot of content myself and then we were having an internal team and I was always like, we should not be doing it ourselves, it should be done by the crowd. So later we added crowdsourcing and then we were reviewing the content internally. The, every content which was coming, it was reviewed by people in the team and that was also very costly. When you're building a company and if you leave anything on the employer dependent, employ whatever time they spend in your office, that's very costly for you. So if anything that you can do crowdsource, that's the best. So I always wanted this content to be crowdsourced written. I always wanted this content to be reviewed also by the crowd. And I slowly built those features over the time. And now at Geeks for Geeks, most of the content that you see on Geeks for Geeks, it's written by the people. We don't write it internally. All the reviews also happen by the crowd. We just do a final publish. Great. What final piece of advice would you offer to aspiring programmers and tech enthusiasts like us? So there are two things I would like to share, guys. Uh, a bit of gyan I would like to give from all my experiences. See, I was never, uh, you know, the best in anything. I was never academically topper. I was never the best coder. Never the, I never played sports. And whenever I tried played sports, I was very bad at it. So one thing that I did very, very good in my life that worked for me, I kept on working on a single thing for 15 years. I started Geek Studies in 2008 and I kept on working and it's 2024 I have worked on the same idea and I strongly believe in this Forrest Gump movie theory, the, the, the theory that this movie conveys that even if you're not the smartest, even if you're not the best, if you keep on working on something for a long, long time, be, as you are a human, you definitely become good at it and you definitely become successful. Consistency, consistency and the perseverance, these are really, really important skills to have and that worked for me. And the second thing I would like to say is, many of us make this mistake that we compare ourselves with others. When I was in BTEC, my roommate was not only college topper, he was like university rank holder. The university where I was in, it was having more than 100 colleges under affiliation and he was like under top 10 in that university. He was my roommate. And those days, online hiring challenges, online codings were not very popular. So the top coders were not the superstars. The superstars were the CGPA wise people. And he was like a superstar in our campus. Everybody used to come to our room and they used to ignore me and used to ask me, you know, how do you study? How do you study? Where book you follow? What, how do you uh, get so many grades? And I was like, I wanted to be like him. I used to compare myself with him. And what I tried was, it was if you, if you were studying 15 hours, I used to try to study 16 hours. If you were studying for 12 hours a day, then 13, 14 hours. And in that process, what happened was, uh, my health became bad because I mean, even after that health problem, after that extra effort, I could barely maintain 70 percent marks. So the thing that I'm trying to convey here is, don't compare yourself with the others. Look at people around you, take inspiration from everybody, whatever I am telling you, take inspiration from me, but don't blindly follow me or don't blindly follow anybody. Just try evaluating yourself more than comparing with others and try to be a better person day by day. That works for me. And that's what I've been doing for last 14, 15 years. Consistency is the key. <laughs> Thank you. As we near the end of our insightful conversation, it's time to add a bit of fun and spontaneity with our rapid fire round. Before we jump into it, uh, let me assure you, sir, that questions are designed to be light-hearted and entertaining. And uh, I'd like to go through the rules. You'll be given a series of quick fire questions and we are looking for your immediate and uh, instinctive responses. Right. There's no right or wrong answer, just whatever comes to your mind first. So the first question is, what is the favorite programming language? So it was always C++, uh, but I suggest... <laughs> Any Java guy here? <laughs> but these days I would suggest that people should switch to Python because it's good for data structures, algorithms, and machine learning work. Any, uh, do you have any favorite mythological character? So I'm not a very religious guy. I did not follow religion too much. I mean, my parents always say that you should go to temple once in a while. But whatever limited knowledge I have, I think Krishna, Lord Krishna is something that I can relate to. His story is the most practical among all the other gods. 
one hobby or interest of yours that many people might not know about uh i watch a lot of movies i mean uh, i watch everything on netflix whatever comes on every friday if you could have dinner with any historical figure who would it be a uh, historical figure figure i think it would be gandhi ji i find him the smartest person uh, in that time and i think so far i mean he did not do much uh, fight and all he still got us out of that problem right i find him the greatest person do you have any favorite sport or video game i don't play games and sports <laughs> but i still i mean play chess once in a while play it a lot with my daughter also <laughs> next question do you plan to join shark tank india as a shark in the near future ah <laughs> <laughs> uh, if i i would love to have an invitation from them if i get an invitation but i am not sure whether i'll be able to uh, perform as well because i don't have a very good eye for investment i never invested but i would love to get an invitation last question how often do you use stack overflow <laughs> stack overflow so when i was studying i used it a lot and even initially when i was writing a lot of articles i used it a lot when i was reviewing articles also i used it a lot to review like is the content written by people Uh, good or not but now i'm not into technical too much i'm more into management so i don't use it much now okay and that concludes the rapid fire round thank you sir for your quick responses now we'd like to open the stage for our audience and this is your time to ask your questions with sandeep sir and uh, please keep the questions relevant to the session and uh, keep it short who'd like to kick us off first mike A very good evening, sir. Good evening. Uh, we would not have survived our labs and assignments without looking up gigs for gigs. The thank you for building and thank you for such an inspirational talk. I would like to ask this question about uh, how much does undergraduate research uh, play a role in getting SD roles in product-based companies? So, for in our institute.